All right, what is going on guys? So today, today I wanted to make a little something for those who are newer to Go, and I wanted to break down 10 concepts and conventions that are unique to Go. So these are sort of things that you're gonna find in Go, but not in a lot of other languages. And there's sort of, there are a lot of things that set the language apart. They're core concepts that will come up again and again. So before I get into that, make sure that you guys are subscribed. I'm gonna have new Go content coming out every single day, all the way through February 28th of this year. And without further ado, Let's start breaking down these 10 concepts. Number one is gonna be convention, and that convention is that all package names should be one lowercase word. Some people do this differently and there's different things, but this is straight from the Go's documentation, the idiomatic Go guide written by the Go developers themselves. They recommend that all of your packages are named with one word, all lowercase, and if you deal with any collisions anywhere, you can simply change the import name on there, but you probably won't run into any collisions for a long time. Number two is gonna be our second and our last convention, and that is gonna be that variable name should be mixed case or snake case, however you wanna call it, which means that you are going to be alternating your the names within your variables by capitalization instead of an underscore. So this is snake case. So snake case is not the preferred convention in Go. It's actually camel casing. So make sure you're doing that. That's what you're going to see in most big libraries. For number three, we're going to start getting into concepts. And the first concept I want to talk about is that that switch statements and if statements can actually take initializations as part of their syntax. So what we can do in here is we can take our if statement right here. We can say if error colon equals foo. So that means that we're calling the foo function. We're assigning it equal to error. And then afterwards, we're putting a semicolon on here. And then we're doing error not equal to nil. And then we're checking it in here. So this error not equal to nil is going to take the value out of this. So if I ran this function, if I do go run main.go, we're going to get out foo error because we returned an error here. But if I just went ahead, and I returned nil, we would get, and I return nil, and we get go run main.go, we're going to get nothing. This will be taking the error value out of this function, and then I'll be printing it out here if it matches this condition. So this is a super way to shorthand if you have like a database call or something like that where you need to pull out an error or a value you can check and then do it all in one line. Makes the syntax a lot cleaner and nicer and something you're gonna see, so you should definitely know it exists. For number four, we're gonna be talking about reassignments using the colon equals operator. So if you're familiar with Go at all, you know that we have this colon equals operator, which will allow us to declare a new variable. Now with this colon equals operator, we can't redeclare something. So if I went up here and I said C colon equals zero, that I did C colon equals one. This is going to yell at me and it's not going to let me to do this because it says no new variables on the left side of colon equals. But I can do this when I have error declared up here. So this is the first time I'm initializing and declaring error. And then down here with B, I'm technically in the syntax, I'm redeclaring error, but Go is smart enough to know that I'm not redeclaring it, but I'm simply changing the value of it. So as long as you have at least one new value on the left side of the colon equals, you can go ahead and use as many old variables as you want and reassign them on with a colon equal statement. This is especially useful when you get into these sort of if error not equal to nil chains where you have to do a bunch of calls to a bunch of functions and then you're gonna get a bunch of errors out and you can go ahead and just check all of these here. You don't have to reassign error or make a new error name every time. Makes it really easy and clean to deal with. Number five, is is going to be the for loop. So in Go, one of the unique things is there is no while loop. If you come from any other language, you're probably used to having a while loop, a do while loop, a for loop, a for each loop, all these things. Go only has a for loop. So within Go, we can use the for loop in many different ways. And when you use it like any of these other loops in all these other languages, you just have to change what you're passing in. So if we're passing in, um, so if we're passing in multiple operators separated by a semicolon, this is going to act like a traditional C type for loop where we initialize some, where we initialize a value here, we set a condition right here, and then we do something here to change our, to update the value in, within the loop. So the traditional example would be I setting I equal to zero, looping until it's less than some value, whatever. But we can also do the same thing that you would get with a while loop over here. So we can do for a condition. So we could just have a condition in here instead of having to do all this stuff by just declaring it like this. And then another thing that we can even do is if we went down here, we did four, um, if we did four and then pass nothing in, this is actually going to go ahead and run infinitely. So this will create an infinite loop. And then right here, I'm adding this break statement to actually break us out of the loop. So we can use a break statement, continue statement, whatever. Those are similar to other languages. But the key thing here is the for loop is what will, the for is what will run all of your loops instead of having a while, a do while, etc. Number six is going to be multiple returns. Go is unique in that it uses multiple returns. And this is sort of typically how it handles its errors. And the way it does this is every method can potentially, every function can potentially return one or more different values. So we could have this foo function up here, which right now obviously is doing nothing of note, but you could have it actually doing something of note. And right here, I'm just having it return zero and nil. And that means that when I come out here and I do full, uh, when I'm getting the values out of foo, I can assign an integer i and I can assign an error error. 
and then I can read based off whatever happens in here. The within the Go documentation, they describe this as trying to get rid of like some of the C anti patterns of where you have to return like negative one or one or a status code from a function that doesn't have any that wouldn't normally have a return or something like that. Um, some people are a lot of people are very split on this, but personally, I like it and it makes it very uh, clean and easy to write your functions, handle your errors. You just pass them up out of the function and you handle them here. So that's a very key thing you need to know. Within Go, functions can have multiple returns. And if you have multiple returns, you need to return for all of those. I can't just go in here and do return one and then nothing. It will yell at me here and it'll say, you need um, not enough return values and need the error over here. Number seven is the defer keyword. The defer keyword is something that not a lot of languages have, but it's one of my favorite things about Go. And it's really subtle, but it makes a lot of sense once you start using it. And it makes managing stuff like database connections or a mutex or something like that, super clean and simple to do. So what, a defer, what the defer keyword will do is it will take any function we have and then it will run this at the end of the it will run whatever we pass into the defer function when its parent function returns. So in this example right here, I have up at the top here, I have defer func. I'm just making an anonymous function here. You could have a named function or import a function or whatever you want to do. So you just defer some function. And what I'm going to do in here is I'm going to say end of loop. So this is technically running at the top. You would expect in any other language, this would run at the very start of this function. But in Go, this is actually going to run at the end because it's deferred. So what you're going to see is you're going to see 0 through 9 printing out down here. Then we'll return. And when we return, we'll actually call this function. So I do go run main.go. You can see we have one through nine being printed or zero through nine being printed out. Then end of loop is printed out. So what's really useful about this is if imagine we have like a database connection. We initialize a database connection in our main method. We're doing all this stuff and then we want to set up a graceful shutdown type thing. We can have it so that whenever we close out this like the run function or something, we can defer closing the database. So on the defer, whenever that function is done, we can close it. Or if we have like a mutex or something at the top, we can lock the mutex and then right underneath we can do, do defer unlock. Makes it super clean and easy to deal with with um it just makes the syntax super nice and clean. Number eight is going to be new versus make. This is a really, really critical thing that a lot of new Go programmers, self-included for a long time, don't really understand. And the key here that you could base, and the key high-level takeaway is that make is only ever used with a slice, a channel, or a map. Because what make is doing is make is actually initializing some underlying data structures that are required for these special types, required for the sl slices, maps, and channels. But everything else, new or just declaring as a var, will suffice. So what does new do? What new will do is we'll initialize and allocate the memory for a new variable, but what it'll do is it'll initialize it to the zero values. So if I go ahead and right here, what I'm doing, if I make this test struct up here and I make a new test struct, this new function is going to initialize a new test struct with all of the values zeroed out within it. So this name will have its zero, this string will have its zero value, which is just an empty string. It'll initialize it to have all its zero values. New will return a pointer to this zeroed out test struct. So right here, you can see I have T is test struct right here. It's a pointer to it. Um, then over down here, I have var v, and then v is actually just going to return a normal test struct because I'm just declaring a test struct. And when you do var something or whatever, it's just going to initialize that variable to its zero value. So different values or structs or whatever in Go have different uh, zero values. They're typically what you would expect, like a string zero value is just an empty string, an integer is a zero, a float is a zero, et cetera, et cetera. It makes a lot of sense. So down here, I'm just printing these out. And then the slice is different. The slice I can't use new to initialize because we have to initialize the length, and then there's a bunch of underlying data structures that Go has to actually initialize for this because these are special built-in functionalities of the language, maps, slices, and channels. So with this slice, what I'm doing is I'm just doing slice colon equals make, and then I'm passing it what I want it to be. So you would pass in a slice, a channel, or a map right here, and then some other arguments for it. So here I'm just saying of length 10. So I'm going to be making a slice of length 10. It's going to allocate that. It'll zero out all the values. If I print this out, what'll, we will get what you expect. So we do go run main.go. We're going to get this. So we get here, we get uh, and, and then empty brackets. So that's going to be T. And remember, I said it's a pointer. So this is actually a reference to uh, this test struct. It's not the actual test struct itself versus V is the test struct itself. So you can see that right here. Then finally, down here with our slice, what we're doing is we're just making this slice. So we're making a new slice, initializing 10 values, and they're all going to be equal to the zero because they're zeroed out. That's they're zeroed out on allocation. So we have 10 zeros in here like this. That's the difference between make and new. I know I've said it many times, but I'll say it one last time. Make is for slices, channels, and maps. Remember that. And if you want to learn more, go take a look at the Go documentation. They have a really great write-up about this. Highly recommend reading it. It is super, super helpful. Number nine is going to be the underscore operator. And what this will allow us to do is this will allow us to safely and harmlessly ignore return values from a function or a method or something like that. So right here, I have this foo function that's going to return an int and an error. Typically, if I went ahead and I did I 
if I declared I and I declared error, Go is going to yell at me because it's a syntax error to declare a variable and then not use it. So what we can do is we can add an underscore in here and then that will allow us to safely ignore it because the other option would be to just not assign it and bring it out. But then foo is going to yell at me because it needs to initialize at least two variables here. So I can do I and then I can do an underscore. So this underscore will be ignored. We don't care about the error. This isn't good practice. You should care about errors. But for this uh, little example, we can just ignore the error with the underscore and then we can go ahead and print out I and it won't yell at us. So it's important to remember if you need to safely ignore something, use the underscore. And for number 10, we have struct methods. This is one that I think is really cool. It's a really cool thing that Go can do. And it's if you declare a struct, you can declare special methods that will be attached dire directly to that struct. So in this example up here, I have type showcase struct. So I'm just creating a struct that has a name within it. And then what I can do is I can declare a new um, I can declare a new function in here, which is func s showcase. So this initial parameter up here, this is actually passing in what I want the struct to be. So I'm passing in what struct I want to attach this to up here. If we don't pass anything up here, it'll just be a normal floating function out in space. But if we put something up here, it'll attach it to whatever we put in here. So I'm attaching this to showcase. Then I'm going to say set name and I'm going to pass in name string. Then set s dot name equals name. This is a pointer and I'll go over why in a moment here. But then down in here in main to actually use this, all I have to do is make a new showcase. And then now I have a attached a method to this struct. So I can do showcase.setName showcase and then fmt.println showcase.name. I do go run main.go and it showcase. So you remember from earlier when we do var showcase, this is going to initialize it to have an empty string for the name. Name is going to be an empty string, but then I'm setting it to have an actual name here with showcase. And the reason I'm able to set it is because I'm passing this in as a pointer. So I went ahead and I got rid of this pointer. This will now be passing in by value instead of by reference. If I run this again, we're going to end up getting Nothing. Nothing prints out because this is still just an empty string because I didn't actually set it. So we have to make sure we pass it in as a pointer if we want to mutate the underlying struct that's calling. And real quick, I want to do a bonus tip. This is one thing that I sort of forgot about, but that I think is absolutely worth talking about. And that is going to be scoping of variables in Go. How are variables scoped? It's entirely based on capitalization. So here's an example I'm going to do real quick. So within this test, I'm going to do func test one. And then this is just going to be a random function in here, which is going to do fmt.println uh, test one. And then we're going to do func test two. And then we're going to do, yep, printing out test two. So we have these two methods in here. And right off the rip, this is going to give me a little squiggly line. It's going to say test two is unused. And why is it saying it's unused? but it's not saying that for this one. And the reason is because this is public. So this is accessible to any other package which imports the uh, which imports test versus this is not. So this is private because it has a lowercase first letter. So the way scoping works is it's based on the first letter. So I went in here and I did test dot. I get test one in here. But if I try and do test dot test two, it's going to yell at me because I can't actually get into it. I can't actually get this. It's going to say test two is not exported by package test. And if I want to make this exported, I can go ahead and switch this to be test two. And I go back over here and then I can say test two. So now it'll work. So it's really important that you remember that scoping is done based on capitalization. And this is how you hide stuff from other underlying packages and make sure that you don't just end up importing stuff that you don't want to import. But it's also how you make sure that you export what you do want to export. So be super mindful of that. Remember, it's all based on capitalization. Hopefully you guys enjoyed this. 10 quick little tips. Nothing. I know this was pretty basic and pretty beginner focused, but I wanted to put out some, uh, some of these sort of ground so it's something that sort of goes over the baseline of Go and the real basic stuff within the language. I think it's worth covering and I don't see a lot of this enough. So thought it was worth putting out there. Hope you guys enjoyed. Have a great day.